السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا أرحم الراحمين Welcome to our seven episode series of uh, Towards a Modern Awakening Today's episode number six where I'll be talking about uh, intentions and spirituality and to be honest um, the word spirituality is a bit superficial for me I would have probably chosen purification in a different setting but um, just so that this is relevant I thought the word spirituality would, would uh, bring forward the meaning that I'm trying to uh, address inshallah and and when you look at it you may even think well intention is spirituality what's the difference is there a difference and why intention specifically the reason that you talk about intention specifically and, and, and looking at it as its own entity is because uh, that's how the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam treated it and that's how all the scholars uh, who followed in uh, yani in islamic history did as well every every book of hadith you open the first uh, hadith right in it innama al-a'malu bin niyat indeed deeds are judged based on their intentions wa innama li kulli imri'in ma na when every person is going to be rewarded and judged based on their intentions. Every book of hadith, I, I kid you not, starts with that, with that specific uh, hadith uh, because of how the scholars revered this hadith and treated it and how important it actually is uh, in our deen. And what intentions actually refer to um, in, in Islam is something called uh, ikhlas, uh, sincerity. Um, the importance of intentions are based on the concept of al-ikhlas, of being sincere. Al-ikhlas is by far probably the most important aspect of being a Muslim. Um, the thing that you should continuously be thinking about, focused on, asking yourself about, revising and revisiting throughout your life is your ikhlas, is your sincerity. Uh, in, the, in the Quran, the surah that is named Al-Ikhlas, it's the only surah in the Quran that's name, the word, the name, doesn't exist within the wording of the surah. Every surah in the Quran, the actual name of it, is a word that exists somewhere in the surah. Except this one. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ The word ikhlas does not exist there. But what ikhlas is, is the, is the natural consequence of believing in these words. Believing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one and the only, that He is the only one to depend upon, that He does not bear children, nor was He ever born, meaning He is the first and the last, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدْ And there is no one that is similar to Him or is associated with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Understanding that about Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, means that you will be sincere towards him when you worship. So ikhlas is the most important thing from a belief perspective, from a creed perspective, tawheed, which is believing in the one and only God, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is ikhlas from a creed perspective, a theological perspective. And it's also the most important thing from a behavioral perspective. Achieving ikhlas, achieving sincerity in your life where the only reason you do something is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, in Islam, um, you know, in, in, intentions or motives are extremely important. Motives are extremely important uh, in Islam. We need to continuously revise why we're doing things throughout our lives until the day we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam Sufyan al-Thawri, for example, you know, once was uh, called to come and attend a funeral. So he had his students around him and they all got up to leave and so Imam Sufyan sat there for maybe 25 seconds and then he got up. And so I asked him, what, Imam, what were you doing? I was, uh, uh, you know, I, I was fixing my intention. I was rectifying my intention. I was making sure my intention was correct. Why don't you do the same? Don't you focus on your intention for a moment? Of course, the students at that point looked at each other. Well, not, 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 as, not as much as we should, apparently. Um, when you, another nice example that we have, uh, Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu, during a battle, uh, he was fighting. Uh, yeah, and he was, he was engaging in battle with, with, with an enemy soldier. And as, as Sayyidina Ali anhu, uh, was, uh, was winning the battle or winning this, uh, the, this, this, uh, this fight, and, almost, and just before he actually you know, uh, delivered the final blow, this, this man spat in uh, Ali radiallahu anhu's face. And when he did that, Ali left him and went and continued to, uh, to fight elsewhere. So this man followed him. And asked him, you know, why would why wouldn't you, you know, I did that as a last, uh, you know, as my last uh, thing to do in life. I was just 
فقال رضي الله عنه كنت قبل أن تفعل ذلك وقاتلك من أجل الله before you did that I was fighting you for the sake of Allah سبحانه وتعالى when you did that I had this anger in me where I wanted to, to punish you for myself and I would never do something for myself it, it's, it's a severe example but it shows you to the, the you know the, uh, the, the, uh, the range of how the uh, our Salaf would look at the concept of intention and the concept of sincerity regardless of whether it was uh, something as simple as attending a funeral or in the midst of battle they were always looking to see how, what their intentions were doing. Um, he, he teaches us, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through a uh, hadith, the uh, hadith Qudsi that we know when, when Allah, he, where he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَنَا أَغْنَى الشُّرَكَاءِ عَنِ الشِّرْكِ فَمَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا أَشْرَكَ فِيهِ مَعِي غَيْرِي تَرَكْتُهُ وَشِرْكَهِ I am, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am the least needing uh, uh, associate when it comes to deeds that are done for me. So if you've done a deed for me and for others, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for other uh, associates, then I will leave my associates to give you their reward. I don't need your deed at all. And, and, and this is a very scary hadith because it's telling us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only going to accept deeds and actions that have been done for him sincerely, where the only motive, you see, the motive, for people, all that matters is what's done. Uh, whether you achieve the goal uh, and you achieve uh, the purpose properly. We, 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 most human beings aren't in, interested in why you did it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more interested in why you did what you did uh, in contrast to actually what you did and how it turned out at, at the end. Meaning for someone to try their best for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not actually achieve the goal and someone else not doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but achieving the goal. For people, they'd rather have the goal achieved. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he'd rather make sure that the motive and the intention behind it was, was perfect. That doesn't mean that we'd rather people fail at what they're doing. No, no, that's not what I'm trying to say. But I'm trying to fo explain the importance of, of, of motives and intentions. And this is something that you'll find all through uh, you know, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Sunnah and all through the Quran as well. Uh, if you go to Surah Al-Zumar, for example, uh, he says, Subhanahu wa Taala, "Qul inni umirtu an a'bud Allah mukhlisan lahu din." Say that I have been commanded to worship Allah Subhanahu wa Taala with full sincerity in terms of how I'm going to deal with His religion. Everything I do is going to be with full sincerity. In the Quran, there's a, uh, an interesting uh, uh, linguistic complex that comes three times in the Quran, where he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, he's telling uh, Musa alayhi salam to talk to Bani Israel after he gave him the Ten Commandments, and they, he said, فَخُذْهَا بِقُوَّةٍ Take this with, uh, with strength and with, uh, with, with seriousness. وَأْمُرْ قَوْمَكَ يَأْخُذُوا بِأَحْسَنِهَا And tell your people to follow the best of it. The best of it, the best of the commandments. Why are there? Is there something that is the worst of the command? Of course not. Alladina yastamiun al qawla fayyatbiun ahsana. Those who hear the word of Allah subhanahu wa taala and follow the best of it, follow the best of it. Does the word of Allah subhanahu wa taala have a section that is the worst of it? Of course not. Hashalil. Of course not. Then what is what does this mean? وَاتَّبِعُوا أَحْسَنَ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ And follow the best of what has been revealed to you by your Lord. The same question, what are we doing? No. So how do you understand the best of what's been revealed? You see, within Islam, there are a thousand commands and instructions and directives and prohibitions and all these different rulings that exist in Islam, thousands of them. Are we going to uh, follow and, and, and practice all these rulings all at once, all the time? Of course not. Of course, that's not, that's not how things work. Certain rulings will be followed in certain times. It's just how Islam yeah, functions. So when you're in a given situation, which ruling or which command or which directive um, are you going to follow? Well, after you learn uh, Islam properly and you do talab al-ilm and you seek knowledge, understand the conditions of everything and how things are supposed to be done, you're left with the question, what command right now would better serve the purpose of the deen? What command right now would, would uh, bring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's satisfaction upon me the most? What would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love me to do right now the most? What is most sincere? I'm going to give you a few examples to so understand what I'm trying to say. You see, it is convenient to tell your children all the ayat and ahadith about birr al-walidain. It's convenient for you, but it's not sincere. Huh? It's convenient for a, a husband to recite upon his wife all the ahadith where the Prophet ﷺ is telling women to, you know, to, to, to treat their husband in a certain way. It's very convenient, but it's not sincere. 
It's convenient when you dislike someone and they make a mistake to decide that this is the right moment to give nasiha and to defend Islam in front of uh, you know, uh, those who are trying to destroy it. It's very convenient to do that publicly. But it's not sincere because if you liked that person, you probably wouldn't have done it in the same way. And I can give you a hundred more examples. You can probably do a hundred more. You can always find a way to justify why you're doing something. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we should do it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us to give nasiha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to defend Islam in front of those who are making mistakes and trying to... True, but at this moment, right now in your situation, is the way that you're doing it the most sincere way? Is the, is the way that you're doing it actually for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or is, is there some self-serving aspect within it? And this is, what, of course, what, what the importance of understanding sincerity is, is uh, intentions, that's what they mean. The, the reason that we have an intention is because we get for a moment to focus on my being sincere. Never stop doing something if you feel your intention isn't 100%. That's not what I'm teaching today or, or, or what I'm talking about. Never stop doing something khayr because you feel your intention isn't perfect. But make sure that you're taking time to actually care about your intention. Which takes me to the second part of what I want to talk about today. Taking care of the concept of, of soul purification or one's self-purification. I believe that the, 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 the actual problem that we have in our ummah today is a problem of nufus. It's a problem of, of, of egos. There's enough space in all our masajid to fit all of our bodies, but there's not enough space in the universe to fit all of our egos. And this is the actual issue that we struggle with. All the problems that you've, you see, and all the disagreements, and the politics, and the lack, if, if, you, if you break them down, you just find that, it, what you'll find at the end of it, or the stem of it, is just an ego problem. Some person who, who dislikes another. Or some, something like that, it's something very simple that if we were focusing on tezkiyah, on purification of our hearts, we wouldn't have. Now the question that is left is, how important is that in Islam? This is the, issue, this is the, the problem for me. How important is it in Islam? There's nothing that is more important than it in Islam. And, this, and, and, I'll, and, the, and the evidence for that is, is, is in abundance. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about why he sends prophets. The reason for sending messengers. Isn't that a question that we, you know, a huge question that needs a huge answer? Why, Ya Rabb, did you send prophets? What purpose do these prophets actually fulfill? You're like, well, to bring the, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took time to explain and say that there are four reasons, there are four purposes prophets are here to actually achieve. Four goals they have to achieve and leave. And he, and he repeats that in the Quran in three different uh, places. Once uh, when Ibrahim is talking, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed his bounty upon the believers. When he descended amongst them a messenger from, from, from within them. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ والحكمة. And then again in Surah Al-Jumu'ah that we all know, هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ فِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ The first goal, which is to recite upon them the signs of God, to tell them who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. You need to know who your Lord is. So you can have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to know who Allah is. If you don't know Allah, you can't have a relationship with Him. You can't have a relationship with anyone that you do not know. Period. So the first, that's the first purpose. Second purpose, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ To purify them. And then after that, وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And teach them the rulings of God, الْكِتَابَ And the wisdom of how and when to practice these rulings, الْحِكْمَةِ But the second reason that prophets are here for is to do tazkiyah, Is to actually purify the hearts and the souls of their followers. And this is something that is extremely underrated today in Islam. We don't, we're not focusing on that. We don't even think about it. We don't even talk about it. You can go through a life in a Muslim family and never hear this concept ever come up, not even once. You'll go through your full childhood as a Muslim and, and this will never be brought up to, with you, which, which is a huge problem because it's the second purpose of why prophets were sent and it's one of the most important things that we have in our, in our deen. Now look at the example of Imam Malik. When he was a child, his mother would put his uh, imam on his head. Uh, وَتَقُولُ لِي إِذْهَبْ إِلَىٰ رَبِيعَةَ الرَّأِي فَتَعَلَّمْ مِنْ أَدَبِهِ قَبْلَ عِلْمِهِ Go to Rabi'ah, which is one of the great scholars of his time, one of Malik's teachers. Go and, and learn from his adab, learn from his manners and his way, his hal, how he, how he behaved. 
the, uh, the, the, the level of reverence or respect he showed the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the words of the Prophet sallallahu which is what people actually remember Imam Malik for, revering the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi revering the, the, the city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi more than all the fiqh, that, and, 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 as important as his fiqh was, radiallahu anhu, alayhi rahmatullah. And I think that's something that we have extremely uh, underestimated. For example, Surah Al-Shams. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes oaths in everything that He's created that you can see on a daily basis. وَالشَّمْسِ وَضُحَاهَا وَالْقَمَرِ إِذَا تَلَاهَا وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا جَلَّاهَا وَالْلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَاهَا وَالسَّمَاءِ وَمَا بَنَاهَا وَالْأَرْضِ وَمَا طَحَاهَا وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا Eleven oaths in a row. Never in the Qur'an will you ever find that again. This is the only place in the Quran where he makes 11 oaths in a row. And he swears subhanahu wa ta'ala by the, the, the sun. And the moment that it shines the most brightly, most brightly in the sky. And, and, and by the moon when it comes after it. And by, the, um, and by the day. And by the night. And by the sky. And everything that went into creating the sky. And by the earth. And everything that went into creating the earth. And by the human soul. And everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put into creating the human soul. And this soul has been given uh, the basic understandings of what's right and what's wrong. And then he, after making these oaths, he's going to tell us why he made these oaths. If I come to you and I say, I swear to God, and I walk away. You're waiting for something. What, what, what's next? You swear to God that? This is called in Arabic, jawabul qasam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, swear, I swear by this and by this and by, I take an oath by this and by this and by this. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Indeed, those who purify their souls are going to be the most successful in this life and the hereafter. And those who fail to purify their souls and let their souls can continue to function the way they will always function will be extremely disappointed. Yawm al Qiyamah. Extremely disappointed. Yawm al Qiyamah. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La yu'minu ahadukum hatta yakuna hawahu taba'al lima jitubih. No one will have full iman until their self-desires are aligned with the teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go to Surah Al-Nazi'ah. Surah Al-Nazi'ah talks about the nafs. That the nafs is, 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 is going to be either what saves you and takes you to Jannah or is going to be what causes you to go to Jahannam. And we're given the example of Fir'aun. Fir'aun, innahu tagha. The problem of Fir'aun, everything he did, the enslavement, and he ran an empire with all the complexities of running something like that. The reason for everything he did is tagha. Tagha means he became arrogant. He was filled with arrogance, that's it. Which led him to oppression. Tughyan is when you're arrogant and your arrogance leads you to oppress people. It's a simple, that's why when Musa السلام, in Surah Al-Nazi'at, when he comes and talks to him, what does he say? He says, فَقُلْ Tell Musa, say this to Fir'aun. هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّ How about you? How about you come along with me and, and, and I teach you how to purify your heart. And I, and I lead you to your Lord so that you may have reverence for him in your heart. This is what Musa السلام, told Fir'aun. Tazakka, how about, how about you purify? If you can purify your soul and your heart, everything will change. Of course he refused. That's why at the end of Surah Al-Nazi'at, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ وَنَهَ النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ and as for those who, who fear the status of their Lord, and restrain them, themselves from, from fulfilling all their self-desires. Just restraining themselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, about the, the concept of someone worshipping their self-desires. There is no faith on earth that has ever made an idol and called it self-desires and worshipped it. This is just a figure of speech. Ara'ayta. مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَاهُ أَفَرَأَيْتَ مَنِ اتَّخَذَ إِلَاهَهُ هَوَاهُ وَأَضَلَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ Twice in the Qur'an, the second one very scary in Surah Al-Jathiyah. Did you see the person who chose their Lord to be their self-desires? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has misguided them even though they are filled with knowledge. If the brain becomes really, really big, but the heart becomes really, really small, this imbalance can never bring khayr. If the, if the head is going to grow, meaning you're going to become more knowledgeable, you're, you're going to have more and more uh, information, you're going to have uh, more and more degrees, the, the brain is getting bigger, the heart has to get bigger as well. So the balance stays. If the heart doesn't get bigger and stays small, there is no khayr to come from that. There really isn't. Um, we have an issue today with, with, with the concept of tazkiyah. It's not important anymore. And I feel bad about that because... That's not how I was taught Islam. That's not how I was raised to become a Muslim. 
this, and, and that made all the difference for me in my life. All the difference was made because of understanding this very simple and clear concept of, of tazkiyah. You see, when you do a deed, when you, when you, when you perform a, an action of any sort, there are, you know, fulfilling the conditions of the action, doing it properly the way the sunnah taught us and the way the Qur'an explains to us. But at the end, there is the, the concept of acceptance of this deed. Do you know that your deed now has been accepted or not? Do you know that? No, you don't. You've done it. But has, has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted it? There's that last step that we have no control over. We can increase the probability of our deeds to be accepted. How? By performing tazkiyah, by making sure there's a lot of sincerity in these deeds and that there's less of all the diseases of the heart within it. We can increase the probability, but you don't know. That's why if you go to different parts of the world, after prayers, people look at each other and say, Taqabbal Allah. It's not a sunnah, but the reason that they do, do this is because the, the scholars over, over years taught people to remind themselves after prayer, you know, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept it from you. Because if He doesn't accept it, Rabbana taqabbal minna. If He doesn't accept it, then what's the point? Not only is the acceptance of the deed extremely important, but the athar al-mutarattib ala al-qabool, meaning the, the, the consequences, uh, the effect Allah's acceptance on your deed will have on you. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts your deed, there's a nur that is going to fill your heart. If you don't get that, then you didn't get anything out of the action. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't benefit from our deeds. It's just we hope that He accepts them. And when He accepts them, He fills our heart with, 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 with light, with nur subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why we know the hadith, رُبَّ صَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ صِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الْجُوعُ وَالتَّعَبُ وَرُبَّ قَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ قِيَامِهِ إِلَّا السَّهْرُ Sorry, إِلَّا السَّهْرُ وَالْعَطَشْ for the first one وَرُبَّ قَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ قِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الْجُوعُ إِلَّا السَّهْرُ وَالتَّعَبُ there are people who fast and all they get from their fasting is being, <laughs> obviously I'm, I'm making mistakes sometimes, is, is uh, hunger and, 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 and thirst. And uh, those who, 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 who perform qiyam and all they get from it is being tired at the end of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahumma a'idhna min thalik wa taqabbal a'malana ya arhamar rahimeen, Allahumma ameen. It's a very scary thing to think about. That everything you do is just not accepted. And the reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't accept something is because it's filled with all these diseases of the heart, all these problems that we didn't take care of. What are the diseases of the heart? Scholars count over 25 of them. Some go up to 30. Uh, I recommend you read Ihya Alum al din for Imam al-Ghazali, uh, reviving uh, the, the, the sciences uh, of Islam for Imam al-Ghazali, rahmatullah I, I, I also advise to read the Risal al-Qushayriya, which is what Imam al-Qushayri wrote uh, in, in a 300-page book. Read At-Tibyan fi Adab Hamal al-Qur'an al-Imam al-Nawawi. These books, uh, the scholars talk about uh, the spiritual aspects, the, the, the tizkiyah aspects of the nasfs. And when they go through all the different uh, uh, diseases of the heart, four stand out as extremely important for us to know. Al-ujb, wal-kibr, wal-hasad, wal-riya. You have to be aware of these four because we were created with these four as a part of who we are. They're there. Unless you remove them, they will stay there, they will grow and they'll get worse. Some people have them smaller when they're you know, just, just by, uh, you know, by, how Allah, by our predispositions and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created our characters. Some of us have different degrees of, uh, of, of, of these, of these uh, diseases. Meaning, uh, not everyone has the exact same degree of each disease. Some people have more ujub than they have kibr, some have more hasid than they have riya. But they're there, all four are there. Meaning, tazki is important because there's no one who is born without them. They're always a part of who you are. If you don't remove them, then they will stay. Now, there's a lot of other ones, but these are the four major ones. If you learn to, 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 to observe them, to watch out for them, then, we can, then you can actually start changing yourself. Vanity, which is ujub. Vanity is when, you're so full, when we're full of ourselves, when we're extremely in admiration of who we are. And of course, what's the right, way, what's the right uh, uh, concept to have? It's confidence. We're supposed to be confident in who we are. Confident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us all the tools, ahsan taqweem, allows us to, to, to fulfill our goal and that he believes in us subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can do it. That's confidence. Ujub vanity is not a good thing. The pendulum of the human experience kind of swings inside of us back and forth. Uh, shaitan wants you either to be extremely vain no, it doesn't want you to be confident because that's the right way. Or you can be someone who has very low self-esteem, which is, of course, another, a, whole, a whole different type of problem that needs a different solution. But we want to hold it down right in the, in the middle of, where we're confident. Use alhamd for that. Alhamd, praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, takes the focus, the spotlight from being on me to being on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What I have is not because I'm smart, because I'm accomplished. 
because I'm hard hardworking. What I have is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving, and because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is patient with me. And that's why I have what I have, and that's the only reason. And you can take it away. You're focusing on praising Allah instead of focusing on praising yourself. Al-kibr, arrogance, for example. Arrogance, the same pendulum is swinging back and forth. Arrogance on one extreme, and then inferiority complexes on the other extreme. And right in the middle is humbleness, humility, which is what the Prophet ﷺ taught to be humble. How do you fix that? Istighfar, you do a lot of istighfar, you focus on your mistakes. You can't be arrogant, you can't think you're better than other people if you're, if, if you're always seeing, I made this mistake, and this mistake, and this mistake, and you're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. I don't know the other people's mistakes. I don't know your mistake, I know mine. As far as I'm concerned, you don't have any mistakes that I can see. So why would I, why would I think I'm better if I, if I know my mistakes and I only assume your mistakes? Why would I base my judgment on assumption rather than on certainty of knowledge, which is I, I know who I am, I know the mistakes I make. So you focus on asking for istighfar and you stay humble throughout your life. Irriya, ostentation, a word I'm becoming more and more familiar with. Showing off, wanting others to see what we're doing, wanting people to focus on how, how caring about people's opinion. The opposite of that is ikhlas, is sincerity. That's why it's so important. Riyah is a form of shirk. Riyah is actually a form of shirk. It's just a small form of shirk, but it's a form of shirk. You're not worshipping people, but you really seem to care about their opinion in you, almost equally to how you, you care about Allah's opinion in you, which makes no sense at all. How can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyesight upon you be equal to other people's eyesight upon you? How can, you be a, a, how can we be ashamed of people looking at us so we don't do dhunub in front of them, but when people aren't looking, we, 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 we commit sin because only Allah is looking at us. It's a musibah. You get rid of that through tasbih. See, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put all the solutions for these things in, this, in Islam. At tasbih, you exalt Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you exalt him, you figure out that there's no one close to him. There's no one like him. No one's worth caring about their opinion but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once that settles in your heart, you're, you're good. You don't care what people say anymore. It takes time, but it, it is achievable. Al-hasad, envy and jealousy. You get rid of that by, having this, by, by filling your heart with love. The opposite of that is love. I envy someone. The opposite of that is to love them and to love khair for them. To love, them, to love for people to achieve and to be great. How do you do that? You, you have to adopt the concept of congregation, of jama'ah. That's why jama'ah is so important. Masajid are closed, yes, but we have to keep the jama'ah spirit alive because once you kill the jama'ah spirit, we can't move forward because hasad starts to fill the hearts of everybody. When I know that you're on my team, when I know that you're wearing the same jersey I'm wearing, we're on the same team, I, don't, I want you to achieve because that means my team will win. But if I don't see you as a part of my team, I... I Hasad is easy. You don't want people to be better than you. We don't want people to be better than us. Unless they're on our team. Unless if we want the team to win. And they're on our team, then yes, be better. Because that means right, we have a stronger team and we'll win. It's just a way of thought that changes. If you want to achieve khushu'a, which is what we do all Ramadan, which, was, which is why we're broken hearted that this year the masajid are empty. You want to achieve khushu'a, you have to love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Houses that don't revolve around loving Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, where he is spoken of alayhi salatu wa where everything he did and taught is celebrated and, and, and the love of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa is being instilled in the hearts of everyone in that household. It's a house that is going to be spiritually thirsty and hungry, spiritually bankrupt because the, his love alayhi salatu wa is what fuels our ability to continue to carry the message of Islam and follow these rulings. If, if you don't love the Prophet alayhi salatu wa you can't love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he is the pathway. He, he takes us to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want to love Allah, yes, I want to love Allah. You have to love the Prophet alayhi salatu wa It's literally impossible to, to, to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without loving him as a Muslim, that is. As a Muslim because he's the one who taught you everything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, the heart can be filled with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where that's all that matters to you, where you're so happy and, 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 and content with just knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is satisfied with you, that He is you know, watching upon you subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He's a part of your life, that He knows and understands your pain and He, and, and he cares about you, that being enough, not needing people around you. This is, a, this is something that is achievable through loving the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. So what is the uh, action plan for today? Just like your body needs food and, and drink and uh, it needs nourishment and it needs rest, your soul needs the same. Our souls are exactly the same. They need nourishment. 
If your body goes without nourishment for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, it starts to die slowly. It starts to die and, and it shrivels down and, and, and you can't survive. And our souls have the same problem. We just, it's just, it doesn't hurt as much and it's not as acute. But our souls have been thirsty and hungry for uh, the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the beauty of the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The action plan is that you have to start taking this seriously. This is one of the most serious aspects of, your, of our existence. We aren't making قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَ Period. If we don't purify our hearts, we will not be successful يوم القيامة. It doesn't matter how many deeds we've done because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's acceptance of these deeds is going to be based on how much we've purified ourselves while doing them. How much sincerity exists in these deeds. How much we have, uh, have purified these deeds from our va- vanity and arrogance and selfishness and uh, oblivion and negligence. If we don't take this seriously, then no- nothing we're doing is going to mount to anything يوم القيامة. Every Muslim should have a, someone who is doing that for them. You need to go and find a shaykh who can teach you this stuff. This is a science. This is, this is a full discipline of Islamic knowledge that, that has been unfortunately turned into a very controversial aspect of Islam, but it's not. And I'm not asking people to go and you know, engage in, in, in full Sufism and, and the problems that they have. That's not what I'm asking you to do. But you need to find someone who can walk you down the pathway of purifying your soul and purifying your heart and becoming someone who understands what, what the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually means, understands where khashu'a comes from, is, you know, and is in a state of, of full calmness and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all, regardless of the changes that happen around, around them in their lives, who actually worship Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they feel they need to, because they feel they want to, they want to be close to Him. It's, it's not arihna minha, it's arihna biha. That, that takes time, that takes effort. You need to find someone who can do that for you, who can teach you, who can educate you. And, and, and alhamdulillah, scholars, uh, they, they exist around. You just have to look for them. You have to take time to focus on that aspect of your existence. There is no benefit of knowledge. You can read all the books of fiqh and all the, if, you, if your heart is not purified, then what you are learning is going to harm you more than it's going to help you because your soul is not ready to accept all this light from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all this knowledge. Every Muslim should have a wird every day, should have a hizb every day. Wird is, a, is an amount of remembrance of Allah. We're doing tasbih and istighfar and hamd. As I told you, they fix the problems. Every Muslim should have a, a hizb, a, a certain amount of Quran that they recite every single day. This, these are little things that we don't do as much or we don't do anymore, even though I can't imagine how a Muslim could survive as a Muslim in the world without doing these things on a, on a daily basis where the remembrance of Allah and the book of Allah is, ev- is, is, is something they do every day. And, they, and they've invested enough time in bringing their hearts closer to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and learning the diseases of the soul and how to deal with them. Being more aware and mindful of who we are as people, what's happening on the inside, and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not looking at our bodies on the outside and what we wear. He's looking at our hearts. He's taking a look, what have you done? Have you purified? Or is that heart filled with clutter and filled with envy and selfishness so that how is His light going to penetrate the darkness of all of that? I advise you to read Ihya Alum al Din for Imam al Ghazali. Read uh, the, the, the hikam of Ibn Ata'illah al Sakandari, the, piece, the pieces of, of, of wisdom that Ibn Ata'illah left. Read these books. Ask scholars to recommend things for you to read so you can learn, so your heart can be brought closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I believe that this is a, an important aspect of our awakening, which is uh, becoming more aw- self aware and, 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 and taking that self awareness from the source of, of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. I hope that was beneficial. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdik, shalom la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruk wa tubu ilayk, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ali wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakum Allah khayyab, barakallah fikum. Before the end, you know, during the, the, these times, uh, the, the, this time that we have, the time of pandemic that we're living through, it's important to realize that our Islamic institutions all around uh, the country, in our city, in, in our city specifically, um, will struggle this, uh, you know, within this period to uh, to meet their financial needs uh, because the masajid aren't filled anymore and people aren't uh, coming in every day and putting in donations and helping them. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to uh, support our Muslim institutions all around the city, uh, specifically our, our, uh, our father institution in, within, uh, within London, uh, the London Muslim Mosque. They have put together a campaign called Better Together. 
you can go to together2020.ca and they, there's a lot of details there of a $10 a weekly donation that will allow the institution to continue to uh, support 200 needy families within the society, uh, meet their basic financial needs to keep the place running and to comp continue to subsidize around 100 students, whether through the Quran programs or through the school, the, Islamic, uh, the, the London, Muslim, uh, London Islamic School. And I encourage everybody to, to do that, to go today uh, online and to, and to support them uh, with whatever you can. To, because these are our Muslim institutions, if we lose them, if they can't meet their needs, then yeah, I mean, basically you know, we're going to lose everything. And uh, do the same for uh, you know, the, the Westmount Center, uh, the Mac Westmount Center that uh, I run most of my halaqat in. Do the same for the Islamic Center, the South, uh, the South Islamic Center, the North London Islamic Center, the Masjid al-Haya, all the different institutions in our city during this period are going to need our financial aid so that they can continue to meet their financial needs and run inshallah and bi idhnillah ta'ala after this is all over things will become yani, better again and we'll be able to figure out some plans for uh, for our future uh, i hope i hope uh, everyone will you know will consider that uh, today assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh